All right, guys, it's your boy Jacob back again for another former player podcast here on SEFC Fan TV, joined by the legendary Gary Bennett. <laughs> nice to meet you, boy yeah. Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. How, how's things going with you? Yeah, good, good. Can't complain. Um, yeah. You know, it's uh, when you get a win under your belt, like everyone's got a smile on their face. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, um, it's just. Um, Getting the win on Tuesday was just such a confidence boost against Tranmere, wasn't it? Yeah, definitely so. Um, I think it was crucial um, for everybody, um, really. Um, the football club, for Phil Parkinson, um, the players as well. Um, and uh, hopefully um, we can get a back-to-back win. Um, look forward to the game against Shrewsbury now. Mm, absolutely. I mean, obviously, you, you do a lot of things away from being behind the mic as well. You're, you're still passionate about your coaching and... Yeah. Like doing stuff with the university as well. How, how's things with on that side going? Yeah, very good. Um, you know, I love working with the university, the students. Um, you know, I'm still very much um, heavily involved with show race and red card. Last Friday we had wear red day, um, and it's number one topic at the present moment. Um, I'm involved in one or two other charities, um, Sunderland Community Kitchen, um, also. So yeah, I try to keep myself ticking over. Mm, absolutely <laughs> yeah and um obviously the team this season it's been it was like a mixed start jack ross is now out the door phil parkinson's come in what do you reckon about the change do you reckon it'll take a bit of time to adapt and well i hope not um yeah. i think we need to hit the ground running i think mm. i think phil parkinson knows that as well is that you know have you got that time to adapt and uh get us to where we need to go um, mm. you know I just think that we've been in this division a season too long now um, yeah absolutely unfortunately, unfortunately it didn't work out last season we had a you know two Wembley appearances um, obviously got beat in the playoff final but you know I think you know I think majority of the players know what this division's all about I think Phil Parkinson knows what this division's all about he's had um, two promotions so hopefully you can get things together, hit the ground running um, mm. and get us sucked where we need to be back into the championship and then hopefully build from there. Yeah, he's, a, he's an experienced man down in this these leagues though, isn't he? So I think his man management skills will be vital, especially with him coming in now and just to like give the confidence that the squad needs because we have got talent in there. It's just a case of putting that into a consistent run you know I mean? yeah definitely so um, you know you look at Phil, Phil Parkinson's CV um, he knows this division mm. um, what he needs now he's, obviously he's only got that squad to work with you know he can't bring anybody in who would like to bring in but on the other hand he's most probably looking at that squad now and he's thinking especially at this level he's most probably thinking he's got some talented players mm. to work with it's just a case of um, putting it's like a jigsaw putting it all together <laughs> um, and hopefully um, you know, you can get us up where we need to be. Um, you know, you look at the first game, which we played, um, disappointing result against um, Wickham. Um, but saying that, he's only had maybe a day or two to work with the team. Um, but he's been able to put that behind him. Um, Tranmere on on the Tuesday night, nobody was expecting that. I think first things first is that he wanted a win. But there was a lot of pluses what came out of the, uh, of the game. You know, to get his first win, first home home game score five goals could have been six <laughs> or seven clean sheet some good performances um, by one or two individuals but you know I keep saying we can't get carried away and yeah absolutely that's, a, that, that, that's one game you know what we need to do is can we go on a run can we do back to back wins mm. you know that's something which you know Phil Parkinson's will be um, hopefully you know dwell, uh, driving into the players heads you know that this is what we need to do we need clean sheets we need to get go on a run and see if we can you know four five six games and then you know then we can start thinking yeah he's the right man yeah and obviously we've got January coming round the corner as well it's that time of the season where recruitment the recruitment process now begins for a lot of clubs in planning on what players are going to be brought in in January to try and improve the team and I reckon Parkinson will be looking at that straight away he'll be looking at you know about bringing players in mm. um, but you'll also be looking at does he need to bring any players in you know mm. you look at the Sunderland squad it's a a, a very very good squad you know um, in depth we've got some mm. good players in depth which you can call upon um, it'll be interesting to see how 
he actually rotates the team? Does he rotate? Does he stick to the the the, the, the eleven which gets him results? Um, does he play four four two? Does he play with one striker? So all these things hopefully can be sorted out because you know maybe you look. We lost Charlie White in the first game. His first game against Wickham. He's going to be out for four to six weeks, which gives opportunities to other forwards in the team. Mm. Um, you know, on Tuesday night, I thought Will Grigg was excellent the way he mm. led the line. Saying that, you know, he had some, he had support in regards of Chris Maguire. Um, you know, we played four four two. Um, the two midfield players who played, Max Power and George Dobson, did very well. Very mobile in there. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there was a lot of pluses. Does he stick with that? Um, you know, Duncan Watmore somebody who we've missed he was able to take us from a defensive position into a forward position especially with the pace he's got which was good um, and we played with a better tempo we created ch- opportunities so yeah you know we, we're we touching on a lot of things there which yeah. we haven't been able to touch on for weeks mm. and also an indication could be that he's keen on bringing Benji Kimioka back into the squad as well which is yeah that's right you know again you know different man management from Phil Parkinson um, to Jack Ross um, saying that I thought Jack Ross did okay mm. you know, it was a little bit of a surprise when obviously he left the club but you know these things happen um, mm. we've been here numerous times in regards yeah. of managers coming in and is he the <laughs> right manager yeah. or whatever so you know we, you know, fingers crossed I just hope that he is um, and it's all about results at the end of the day and, and if he gets us the results then he is the right man yeah now Moving on to a bit of a personal topic, obviously it's been a very sad, dark time for our game at the moment with all the racism going on and the the debate whether players should walk off the pitch and obviously the incident that happened in the Harringay Borough mm-hmm. FA Cup tie which was absolutely disgraceful when you watch the footage. I mean, what is your thoughts on it? I mean, surely like watching that England game against Bulgaria, like, your heart must have been like racing. Yeah, yeah, you know, you know it's, it's number one topic at the present moment mm. um, in regards of what can we do, what shall we do, and are they going to do anything? Um, you know, we, we talk about the Bulgaria game, but people keep asking, have we moved on? I don't think so mm. at the present moment. Mm. Yes, we seems to have gone backwards, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, you know, I, I can remember 2004. England played Spain. Same, eight o'clock kickoff. Same incidents happened. Um, Wright Phillips, Sean Wright Phillips, and the other black players who played in that game. You know the monkey chance went on, um, and we're talking about it fifteen years on. Yeah. And if and and the question is, what can we do? You know we haven't done anything for fifteen years. So you've got to look at maybe. Um, the governing body, um, you know, UEFA, FIFA, whoever, in regards of punishment. Now, you look at the game against Bulgaria, half of the ground was shut mm. because they've had incidents there before, yet there were still um, supporters who were allowed in. Yeah, that's that's the confusing thing about uh, it. And But, you know, they made a statement and they were allowed to get up, walk out of the stadium unchallenged and disappear you know mm. so you're thinking how did it get in surely they must have known who they were but they were still allowed just to walk up get up out of the seats walk out of the stadium nothing not unchallenged so you look at incidents like that you look at the manager of Bulgaria the coach of Bulgaria you know he come out and said he never heard anything now how many times have we heard managers yeah. come out and say I, I never heard anything you know you look at you know what the punish finding them is not going to hurt them you know shutting down half of the ground is not going to hurt them you know so in a way it's left it's being left to the players on the pitch to make a stance mm. and their stance is that we'll have to walk off because nothing's being done at the top level so you know, you, you you find, and the biggest question is that people ask, how does it feel when you've been r- racially abused? Mm. You know, uh, and it's just the same as like, um, 
if you're a boxer say for instance you're a boxer how does it feel <laughs> asking a question how does it feel when you're getting punched in the face you know and you're trying to explain but if you haven't actually been in that position you do not know how it feels what's it like you know from the outside looking in you know you look at these for instance i'm using boxing um as an as a target saying you know these big lads who are in the ring you know toe to toe you know and we're just on the outside looking in thinking wow that's good but to be in that position to actually receive <laughs> them sort of punches at that power we <laughs> we do not know you've got to be in that position to actually feel it and it's the same with racism mm. you've got to be in that position you've got to be on the end of racism to understand how that feels yeah i mean just um so sad like thoughts go out to a play like tyrone mings as well like in years to come people are like making your England debut must be like the, one of the proudest things in your career and it's a night that he'll probably want to forget right? well not necessarily to, to to forget it's what he's going to be remembered for he's not going to be remem remembered for his debut no he's going to be not. remembered that he actually turned round to one of the officials and, and asked the question did you hear that that's what he's going to be known for mm. absolutely I mean it's just I mean the first it was the first time we saw, was it the three-step process put yeah. into play? How did you think that went? Like How did I think that? Yeah. Well, it, it was a it's, bit it's, confusing at times, wasn't it? it? Confusing, but yeah. you know, the question is, why does it need to go to three? Why does it need three times before you actually make a decision? Why can't you say, okay, after the first incident, you, you, you'll make a decision in regards of what you're going to do. Now, if I'm in a position and you're going to give me three opportunities, for instance, take a penalty, and I know that I'm going to get three efforts before, you know, I score or not, <laughs> you're going to take it, aren't you? So yeah. I know I'm going to take the first penalty. Oh, he saved it, but I know I'm going to get a second one. Oh, he saves it, but I know I'm going to get a third one. <laughs> That's it's, it's the same. Yeah. You know, so you say to yourself, why should you get three opportunities? Mm. I mean, like, Obviously, the huge debate has been whether players should walk off the pitch, considering how bad it. Obviously, Chris Kamara. I remember listening to him on BBC television not so long ago, saying that um, he thought it was the right decision mm -hmm. for Gareth Southgate to keep his players on the field and not mm -hmm. take them off. And obviously, but obviously, we've seen the incident at Harringay Borough where the manager decided to take his players off with the incident. What happened with the goalkeeper? What? What what do you think needs to be done in terms of management, like getting it, it across to the officials and the referees to let them know what the problem is and trying to help sort out with his t teammates as well. Well, first um, of all, you know the referee. Um, you know he's refereeing the game. Okay, he'll be focused on the game, but surely he can hear, and he's in a position to make a decision in regards of does he stop the game or does he continue. And then he can go over to maybe the fourth official. And that's what they're talking about, is that he can obviously put it out on the tannoy to the stadium, to the supporters. You know, if this incident doesn't stop, then this game will be called off. Now, it seems as though, how I feel, that sometimes it feels as though you're passing the book on. Now, you're passing it on to managers, coaches, to make a decision, and also to players to make a decision in regards of you know if they hear it they're going to walk off the pitch they should not be put in that position mm. why should it be left to the players when you've got unions you've got the UEFA you've got FIFA they should be saying right any form of racism this is what's going to happen at the present moment I think we're still waiting to see what's going to happen to Bulgaria <sighs> Yeah. <laughs> so you're thinking they haven't really got anything in place you know and you've got people who will make these decisions and be thinking well what do we do now you know these things should have been put in place and we're talking 2019 now mm. you know we, we've I've just talked about an incident which happened in 2004 so are we going to be 15 years later on down the line 
talking, oh, well, what's what's going to happen? Mm. <laughs> Honest, I mean, like, you in the prime of your career, mm. was it the 1980s mm. was like a really dark time of when it was coming, Yeah, like, week in, week out with, obviously, John Barnes when yeah. he, he was starting his career as well. I mean, seeing it, like, like slowly crept back in in 2019, it's just... <sighs> There's just no no place for it at all. There's no place for it, and you know you, you just mentioned there in, in the eighties, seventies. Um, I, I think um, as a nation, um, as a country, um, I think we're a lot more educated in regards of racism. Um, we're a lot more aware. Um, I think we're in a position now where I think individually or as a group we will challenge it. You know, especially if you hear something that makes you feel uncomfortable. And you know you're going to ask the the question, and you are not born a racist. You know <laughs> you're not born a racist. You learn to be a racist. That's what happens. And then you ask, where does it come from? Mm-hmm. You know where do you where where do you learn your terminology from? You know it might come from your parents, your family members, friends. It comes from somewhere. Mm. I mean, it's just like when you see it happen in the stands with like the amount of technology that's in football stadiums now it's almost like it begs the question why do they feel like they are taking the risk to try and get away with it now mm. you know it's funny you're talking about punishments and things like that and I, and I you it's know, not, it's, the punishments are not enough now yeah and, and and you just you know you talk about um, the Harringate game there and you know there's, I think there's one or two being arrests and you're thinking, well, what do you do with them? Um, you know, them people who's been arrested, lock them up. But I would do it. I would lock them up and maybe put them in the same cell as somebody who is black. <laughs> and then we'll see, and then ask the question, how would they feel? Yeah, I mean, it's just like, because there's just been like tremendous black players over the years and especially like over the last couple of years as well just like uh, wh- why is why is it getting back into our game now it's just uh. well it's, it's it's interesting but you know we're talking about um racism and yeah we're talking about black players but you know when we talk about racism it can happen to anybody you know it's not just about black players it can happen to white players it can happen to players of different nationality it can happen to players of different religion which we've seen as well um players of different culture as well but um yeah the number one target is um color of skin you know and that's the first thing which you see you know and you know you ask that question especially when uh, maybe a young person says something and the answer to that is oh well he, he doesn't understand they don't understand because he's only maybe two-year-old or three-year-old he, he, he doesn't know when you are born you do identify you do know the difference between colour <laughs> that's for sure you know what's black and white when you're born you know so for somebody to say well I don't, I don't understand if you know about skin colour you do that's the first thing you know no matter where I go if I walked into um a shopping precinct if I walked into a school with you Jacob the first thing they'll see or notice between me and you is that I'm good looking <laughs> yeah. no 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 but you're, you're not no, wrong there guys. no, <laughs> no the, the first thing they'll see between me and you Jacob is our skin colour that's the first thing you'll see you'll see that I'm black you're white that's the first thing you see and if somebody says, oh, I didn't notice, they're telling lies. <laughs> as simple as that. There's nothing wrong with noticing somebody's skin colour. And there's nothing wrong with saying, you're white and I'm black. There's nothing wrong with that. That's just being truthful. <laughs> Absolutely. With, um, obviously, the campaign that you're working for in terms of your coaching yeah. to try, what's, what sort of things are you doing to try and prevent this coming into our game at the well I work for Shaw Racing Red Card I've been involved with Shaw Racing Red Card for over 20 odd years now um, it was set up from believe it or not somebody who's a black and white Jed Greppy 
fantastic fella. And he was appalled about all the races chance. I was a receiver when I played against Newcastle United. Um, they already had something which was active, black and white, and he's taken it from there. But we use football as a tool. It's not just about eradicating football, eradicating racism out of football. It's out of society, you know, but we use football as a tool. And, you know, we, we, we do workshops. Um, we talk about what racism is and how it can affect anybody. And, you know, we talk about terminology um, and we talk about, you know, if it happens, what can you do? Where can you, you know, where can you report it? It's important that you report it. Mm. And also reporting it in the right way as Correct. well to get the message across. Correct, yeah, it's reporting in, in in the right way. And and I'm a great believer in if I hear something and we're not just talking about racism, we could be talking anything in, in, in regards of any discrimination or equality, anything. You know, if if I hear something and it makes me feel uncomfortable with, I just think that I'm in the right to challenge it in the right way. Mm. Uh, obviously, m moving on from or the, the very dark days in our game at the moment, you've obviously you had some fantastic moments in your career and obviously you wearing the badge it like must mean a lot to you for Sunderland Football Club and the amount of great memories you've had to play with characters in the dressing room like Kevin Ball mm. and people are do you do you have like a standout memory from <laughs> Is it, dressing room it, I've got a lot I've got loads of I've got loads of memories <laughs> but I, can, I don't think I can um yeah, them on we, 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 can, we can imagine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But no, as I said, you know, uh, my time at Sunderland Football Club is fantastic. You know, Sunderland Football Club has been my life. Um, you know, if, if you would have said that I would have been at the football club for over 11 and a half years, then I would have said that you're from a different planet. But, um, you know, one thing about football in the North East... It's, it, it's a different level. It's a different level, and yeah. you, you, you know, you know yourself. You try to explain this to people who don't live in the northeast, what football means, and you've got to actually be up in the northeast. You've got to live in the northeast to understand what it means, not just to play um, for the, for one of the clubs, but to support one of the clubs. Mm. I feel you like know, further down the country you go, a lot of fans, especially like in London, don't get it. They don't get it. They don't that. get it. They don't understand. You know? And as I said, you've got to be amongst it to understand what it means and what it's all about. You know, you, I, it, there's only two clubs you, you support when if you're in the North East. You're either black and white or red and white. There's no in between. Yes, you do have the odd one or two who might be glory hunters and what a Chelsea <laughs> shirt or a Manchester City shirt or a Manchester United shirt or, but, um, you know, you, you're talking about over 90, maybe 95% of um, people in the North East support Newcastle or Sunderland. And you don't have to be from Sunderland to support Sunderland. You know, you could be over the other side of the wall. You could be in that side and still support Sunderland. You could be in Sunderland and support Newcastle. <laughs> that's the picture. <laughs> that, that, that is, that what, that's what makes it so fascinating, you know, and... It's something which is spoken about on a daily basis and it's something which, for me, you know, keeps the North East living. Yeah. I mean, when you made that move from, is it Cardiff City? Yes. All those years ago, I mean, what, was there any persuasion in that? You talked to players who played in this region before <coughs> or? Well, strange enough, you know, the, one of the reasons why I came um, to this region was um, Len Asherist. Len Asherist was, um, obviously, he was a legend at Sunderland Football Club, but he was my, also my manager at Cardiff City. And um, obviously, Sunderland was struggling at the time, and they had to change the manager again. <laughs> <laughs> so um, they called upon Len, um, and Len made that move to Sunderland, um, trying to keep him up. Um, and in the meantime, he obviously had a couple of words with me and said look Gary you know I'm going to Sunderland it's an opportunity I can't turn down because it was managing at the top level but I would like you to join me um, he knew that my contract was up in the summer um, which was great for me you know chance to play top level football that's what you something which you look forward to and um, you know I just thought this is something which I couldn't turn, turn down I didn't know much about Sunderland I must admit you know you, you don't understand or know until you have actually made that move and get to understand what the area and the people's all about mm. 
I mean, one of my favourite memory of yours is um, the goal you scored. It was against Manchester United. Mm. The flick over the defender yeah. and putting it in the far corner. I mean, scoring goals at Roker Park here in that Roker Raw as yeah. a player, like what? That it's, some some players have said in the past it burst your eardrums. Yeah, it's unreal, <laughs> unreal. You know, we, we we've got a fantastic stadium. Um, the stadium of light, fantastic. You know, um, you know, credit to Sir Bob Murray who built it. But um, you know, if you've ever had the opportunity to sample or play at Roker Park, and not necessarily play, but even to be a supporter at Roker Park, especially on a night time, a night game, mm. you know, the floodlights on. And you know you talk famously about that Roker Raw. Um, you've got to be there to actually witness it, and it puts the hairs on you. You know what I mean? You, you, <laughs> oh God! You know it, 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 it. You've got to be amongst it to understand what it meant. You know, as I said, we've got we've got the stadium alight. You know, we've got night games, but it's totally totally different to Roker Park. Uh, you know, and it was well known for that Roker Row. You know, before the kick off, the old place went up. You know, fantastic, and just to hear that, you know, you've got to go out there and you've got, you know, you know that the players are going to give hundred percent because of that. Yeah, and it's obviously nice to see with our fan base as well trying to bring that into the stadium of light as well with the flags last season yeah. and renaming the stand. And obviously, I think it will take time. It won't happen overnight, but I think when. Is it that south south stand? Yeah. Isn't it when the south stand gets rocking? It can really like be intimidating. To yeah, that's players. right. That's right. And you know, again, you know, I keep talking about the Roker Park days and the Stadium of Light days. You know, there's a couple of times when you know the Stadium of Light has been rocking, but you knew that at Roker Park every night game it was going to be is going to be rocking. It was you know it was like the twelfth man. You know, Roker Park. You know, once they got right behind you, it was a a pleasure and an experience just to play there. I mean, it feels like when you see football stadiums now, there's not many of those grounds like left that are like that, like really enclosed, close to the pitch. And you would say, as a supporter being myself, you enjoy going to those grounds more in yeah. terms of atmosphere. Yeah, definitely so. Uh, and again, you, know, it's, you, you try to sometimes explain to young people in regards of the grounds and... You know, compared to the new grounds, you know, you, you're talking about the old grounds was amongst houses. You went along, and you know, you can smell the burgers, and it, you know, the players just jumped out of the cars, just walk straight in. You get the autographs. It was a totally, totally different experience to now. You know, some of it, I think, huge buildings now, huge stadiums now, and you know, I think it's glossed over. It's glossed over, and uh, you know, you, you you cannot take away. Um, you know the old grounds. You know what it brought. You know characters. Um, it was a lot more friendlier. Um, the people who worked at the at the football club. You know, I just thought, you know, it, it's totally, totally different now. Obviously, play, playing at Roker Park, like when the opposition comes, obviously it is you're in for a battle and scrap mm. with like the way the crowd influences the team, and I think uh, one incident in particular that um, has been put forward to me to ask you is the incident about David Speedy the David <laughs> Speedy incident you know you played you played near enough well I played over 400 and odd games um, and that's the one incident that everybody remembers me for they don't remember me for me 25 goals which I scored <laughs> it's that one incident um, against David Speedy and obviously they all build up for it and you know David Speedy good player good player but he was one of them players who was niggling all the time he was on your case and mm. it was one of them <laughs> occasions where yeah you you, you could tackle yeah. in them days you know you, you, if... you, you had <laughs> you, you had one and one and two battles in them days you know your centre forward against your centre half you know you, you'll be at it for the hold of the 90 minutes come to the end finished shake hands off you went you know you might have split your eye or whatever it was or whatever you two of you have been at it but um yeah the david speedy incident you know i just come back from injury i was a little bit annoyed he went over the top and um i went over the top with him so yeah these things happen and a lot of them things happen um especially in them days i think you had players who were very very passionate shall we say um they cared and 
the, I'm not saying that they, don't, they did want to win. They didn't want to get beat and they'd do anything to win the game. Yeah. I mean, I remember speaking to um, Kevin Ball. We've had this debate. There's there's not many players like that now. No, you know, uh, you, know you you well, you look at how, how football is now. Fantastic, you know, the surfaces, what they play on, mm. everything, the medical care, what they've mm. got now. You know, you, you look back, especially when obviously myself and Bally and people before me who played, we didn't have it, all that medical stuff. You know, if anything, if you was injured, then, you know, the worst you would get would maybe an injection. There you go, off you go, off, in, off you go and play. You know, if you, you know, I, I know players who may, might have pulled the hamstrings, you know, but they still played on, you know. Um, you know, they... <laughs> It's a different different breed, shall we say? Yeah. Different breed of 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 of, of um, players. Um, you knew what you were going to get. Obviously, you know they talk a lot about the money now in the game. Is it too much money in the game? Um, you know, do they have that sort of shall we want to win? Care? You know, um, obviously when I was playing and players before me and Bali and people like that. We would be over the moon if we was getting bonuses. <laughs> you know, yeah. that we, we had to play. You know, we was over the moon if we got a, a few extra quid, you know, mm. because that's how much it, it mattered to us. Now, you're thinking the money which is which is being paid out now, you're thinking, you know, you're, you're ridiculous. Mm. Yeah. You know, you would ridiculous never have thought, <laughs> you would never have thought that you would get to the stage now where players are earning two, three, Four hundred grand a week, <laughs> you know. And you're thinking, whew, unbelievable. Yeah. Um, the early '90s was, I'd say, the prime of your career mm. um, as a centre back and a player for Sunderland AFC. Obviously, the FA Cup final came about in 1992. Sadly, it was it was yeah. a defeat to Liverpool on the day we went in massive underdogs. Mm -hmm. y you were part of the squad that mm. day, wasn't it? Like. What was the overall experience that day and like the Fantastic. building up to it? Yeah, great, great. As I said, um, you know, again, as a youngster growing up, you want to play football, you want to be a professional footballer, you want to play at the top level. And then a the highlight of your days, you want to play in the FA Cup final. You want to mm -hmm. play in a final because the FA Cup final, um, even leading up to then, was... You should start... start coverage at like 10 that, that's, in the like, that's what I'm talking about you know that, that was the highlight for everybody um, in the country you know mm. you get up the build up yeah. to the cup final you know you're following the coaches and the players out the, at the breakfast you know getting to the arriving to the ground getting off the coach watching them going into you know the whole day was around yeah. the FA Cup final you know families would sit in front, you know, to make sure that, that everything was in place. You know, it was a, a like a party for him. Yeah. You know, and and getting to the FA Cup final in nineteen ninety two obviously brought up a lot of things in regards of could we do it? You know, set, you go back to seventy three, which was a fantastic, marvelous occasion and great achievement by Sunderland Football Club to win the FA Cup final in nineteen seventy three. And you know, it was similar. Could we do it again? You know, it's Liverpool wasn't having the best of times um, we had a hell of a, a cup run um, mm. beat some good teams on the way and we just thought this could be it this mm. could be our our day yeah. um, unfortunately we had a couple of opportunities we didn't take them and Liverpool if I remember well scored straight after half time it and it was Michael a case Thomas, yeah, yeah and it was a case of once they started growing with confidence you know there was only going to be one winner we tried our hardest to get back into the game but Great experience, you know. You, you can't, you can't, not take that away from you, you, being involved in the final. Yes, it being icing on the cake would have been winning, but at least you got to the final. You know, if you would have got beat in the semi final, we, we played Norwich, mm, at Hillsborough. <laughs> That's right. You know, if we would have got beat, then then what if and all that. But you know, overall, I've, I think it was a fantastic experience for for the players, for the football club, and for the supporters as well. Mm. And it was it was a talented Liverpool team. Was it? They didn't have the success that year, but obviously they had players in there. Was it Dean Saunders? Dean Saunders, Steve McManaman, yeah. Matt Manaman, Ian Rush. You know, so yeah, they had a very very Liverpool talented team. You know, we 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 were great that we were there. You know, we beat some very very good teams on the way. You know, your West Ham's, your Tottenham's, and people like that we beat on the way. So 
yeah, it, it was a great, great day for us. Um, as I said, great memory. You know, I mean, we talk about what if. You know, John Byrne scored in every round leading up to then. Unfortunately, he couldn't score in the final. But, you know, you, you just put that down as a memory. Mm. I guess, obviously, you'd be building up to it. You were on the phone to David Bennett, who played in Well, if, uh, yes, <laughs> yes, 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 indeed. And I, 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 spoke, I was speaking about that the other day in regards of, you know, talk about brothers, um, you know, the, uh, talking about um, the long, long staffs the other day, you know, the brothers mm. and uh, competition. And, and as brothers, you do have competition. Uh, you know that's rivalry. You, you have it from <laughs> day one when you're born. Um, so you can imagine that the rivalry there. And there's a rivalry between me and my brother. And obviously, he tried to get one over on me, which <laughs> he has done in regards of 1987. They beat Tottenham three-two for Coventry. He's got to win his medal. I've got to lose his medal. So he's got the bragging rights. <laughs> I guess the obviously like the last just sums up the love between that you have between you two and obviously the me the memory I watch in that final back like took his goal brilliantly in that is it the diving header yeah, from Keith yeah, Alchin Keith Alchin, that's yeah, yeah. yeah that was a great game and, and funny enough people ask me you know did I go to that game I, I, I had a ticket to go I couldn't get there reason being is that on the Sunday we were playing Gillingham <laughs> everybody knows what happened there uh, at home at Roker Park. You might have to remind me because I don't was, even, don't, I don't, born oh, there. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> In them days, they had a sort of so-called playoffs. So it was. Um, oh, was it playoffs to go down? Correct. Oh. So we, we we played Gillingham and we played them away. We got beat and then we played them at home, and it ended up six six on aggregate. But because they scored on the way goals, in fact, relegated us to the first time in um, Division Three, which obviously coincides with Division 1 now. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, we've you know, I've had loads of questions in regards of Sunderland being in, at this level. The last time they was at this level, they bounced straight back. And, um, you know, we look back now um, at that level when we played. Um, it was fantastic. Excellent. We, we, we had some fantastic away days. You know, and, and and the pleasing thing was amongst the supporters was uh, okay, disappointment. We got relegated, um, but what we were able to do, we brushed ourselves down. We had one or two new players in the team. The likes of Gabardini was back involved in the team. Eric Gates. Um, we had some young players coming through, the likes of Gordon Armstrong and Gary Hours. Um, we were able to get young players uh, mixed with um, one or two experienced players, and we went on a fantastic season yeah yeah we didn't start off too well but you know by the end you know talk to one or two supporters they had some great times because we were winning winning games mm. and you know playing at this level is you know people think that you because you've come from the Premier League so called right down to this level that you're going to bounce straight back it's not you know you've got to earn the right you know what this division's all about it's it's a hard league it's a hard league um, you got to be strong, you know. You're coming up against some teams mm -hmm. which are mentality. big, strong. Yeah. You know the mentality. Okay, they might not have your ability, but they'll run for you know the 90 minutes, and you've got to make sure that you compete with them. We were able to bounce straight back, which was fantastic for us. Um, and we know all know what happened with Sunderland last season, but hopefully, fingers crossed that they can do it this season. Yeah, it's sl it's slowly starting to come back to me now. I mean, I assumed was it back then? It was just you ended up just finishing the relegation zone and relegate I just completely forgot that there was playoffs <laughs> yes, yeah, there's play I mean what, what would you think if they brought that back now like, well it's a strange one because I think they only had it for one season and and how it worked was if you finished I think it was third bottom of your division you ended up playing the team in third in the division below oh. <laughs> so so that's how it worked um, so we ended up obviously third bottom. We played the team who was third at the top, and then that's how it happened. I think it only happened for one season, and then they got rid of it. <laughs> I mean, obviously, that's obviously that's the time you'd, you'd want to forget. But it's it was so nice to see. See the following season, you went up as champions. Yeah. In, in the third, I mean, speaking to like some of the older fans now, like they've said to me that's that one season you had when you finished champions of the third tier that's the season they enjoyed best as a fan yeah they did indeed you know we had uh, 
fant- you know, you talk about times and memories. We play that Wigan, you know, and we're talking about um, some of these grounds now are non existent at the present moment because they're not there. We've got new stadiums now. Um, but we played at Wigan, um, a night game, it was absolutely pouring down with rain. And um, beyond nice one, pitch. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> they're not like the pitches what they no. are now, by the way. You know like what I mean? As, as, as long as. You know, you could see the lines, they played the game. And, it, oh, you know, the rain was pouring down, it was muddy. But behind one of the goals, they had this big hill and um, and the Sunder supporters behind there. And uh, at that time, we had um, an international skier called Eddie the Eagle. And these lads thought, coming down this big slope in the mud, oh, and it was fantastic ended up right behind yeah it's fantastic <laughs> you know they were brilliant brilliant but it's you know we, we were traveling away in thousands you know the, the supporters look forward to especially the away games because we were winning week in week out they made a they made a day of it you know they enjoyed it and that's that's the thing no matter what level you at you know as long as you're winning supporters are happy and obviously going to port vale yeah. that winning the lead that day I think that's when you watch the footage back that's the most packed you've ever seen like a Sunderland away end Just yeah like it, as I said days. you know we, we, we talk about um, supporters travelling away from home and as you just mentioned there Port Vale great support great support um, you know and we had great support right throughout the season but you know later on the season after we went to Manchester City Last game of the season, we had to win, and we had to um, we had to have one or two results go our way. And we went to Manchester City, you know, even though the position we were in, and we took seventeen thousand supporters to Main Road, wow. and Manchester City, they applauded us. They were in shock. They couldn't believe that we had seventeen thousand supporters, especially in the position we were supporting our football club and that's why you know they've got close ties with Manchester City you know at the end of the at the end of the game you know even the Manchester City supporters applauded the Sunderland supporters for their support you know mm. and that just goes to show you um, you know this club the, the supporters what it means and no matter what they always are going to be behind you absolutely I mean with famous group without fans then no Play. club. No, no club. <laughs> <laughs> you know, as it, simple as that. And, you know, we, we, we played Tradmere on um, Tuesday night. And, uh, you know, the crowd, over 28,000. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got one or two Premier League clubs who are not going to get 28,000. Mm. Never mind on the Tuesday yeah. night. Boxing Day last season, yeah. Bradford City, 46,000. You know, and if you, you know, again, easier said than done. You know, if this club was winning week in, week out, no matter what level, they'll pack the stadium light out. That's for sure. Mm. You just like what if um, <clears throat> at the top? I mean, obviously Stuart Donald's doing a fantastic mm. job since he's come in. But you think like he pretend, over time, if he can get it right, then like this club in terms of atmosphere will be just absolutely bouncing. Yeah, they'll have to bring. A, they'll have to build another tier, which you know, <laughs> there's plans there. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, they've got to get it right, and it's all what happens on that football pitch, you know, determines what happens off it. You know, you've got to make sure, you know, we've got the right team, the right players, um, the right mentality, um, and hopefully, you know, we can get back to where we need to be. Mm. I mean, but like you, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's such a frustrating league to play in, but you've got to face it and simply there's a, the only way is up well exactly exactly it, it is what it is you've got to remember this is the level we're at we are not at the Premier League now we're not a championship club we are a first division club yeah and and, and that's something which we need to take on board mm-hmm. um, we've got to take on the type of football yes you know sometimes it's not pretty but we don't need to be pretty to win games you know the the most important thing is about the three points and if we can get the three points and move on get out of this division and then we can you know have a look um and then recruit hopefully recruit the right players and then hopefully get on a nice little run and get out of the championship as well i mean stuart was on on the radio i think it was after jack ross had left and he came out with the quote it's the most organized he thinks it's the most organized league one club 
in terms of how it's run that I think anyone's seen for absolutely years. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, but, I, I just like that just sums up like Stuart Donald really. I think right. just like the fact that he's he comes on the radio, really connects with the fans, and mm. having someone at the top like that is just like such a lovely thing to see. Yeah, yeah, it's fantastic. But at the end of the day, it's what happens on the pitch. Mm. You know, you can have the well organised, well run, um, the prettiest, you know, um, club in the divisions, but it's the results. It's all about results. It's what happens. You know, as I said, we can have everything in place off the pitch, but if you're not producing the goods on the pitch, then all that you might as well forget about it. Mm. I- just like <laughs> you can get all yeah. the pat, you can get all the pats on the back and whatever it is, you know it, it's it's funny. I was just watching um, who was playing the other day. Was it Arsenal? Arsenal were playing at the weekend, and you know they had all the possession and whatever. At Sheffield United, Sheffield yeah. United, and they look good. Oh, they look fantastic! Look how much possession they've got. They're passing the ball about. Oh, yeah, object. Put the ball in the back of the net. You put the ball in the back of the net, you've got a chance of winning. Mm. To lose the game, you, see, you get all the applause, it's all the fantastic, but you didn't get the points. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and also the. the you know, but, uh, yeah. and, and just going back on that, you know, we went to Wickham. Wickham is Wickham. You know, they play a little bit more like Wimbledon. You know what I mean? But, you know, I'm not disrespecting that. That's They play to their strengths. That's what, that, that's what their game's all about. Mm. And. I've got to say they're good at it. And what they are doing, they're getting results. They don't mind. No. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean that um that Wickham game is like it was a typical League One game, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. It like, is. Battle scrap, but at the end of the day they came out with the goal that got them the win exactly. and we didn't. You yeah. know, they they came out with the goal and that, you know, they, they they walk away, they've got the points. And it's all right saying, Oh well Sunderland, yeah, we did this, we did that. No, they got the points. Might not be pretty, but they got the points, and that's and that did, it's like the bottom line. That's what you look at. You look at the outcome. Mm, absolutely. Going back now to obviously your f- famous memory lane. Um, players you've played with like over the years. What, which one like stands out that you enjoy to walk out on that pitch with? Ooh, got so many. <laughs> got so many. You know. On and off the field, you know, you got characters. Um, you know, uh, got some great friends. You know, when I first went to the football club, you know, I, I was up, I was lucky enough to play with, alongside the likes of Sean, Sean Elliott, great professional. You know, good player. Um, didn't play enough games with him. He moved on later on to Norwich. Um, David Hodgson, who I played with, who I'm still very friendly. I talk to him every single week. You know, Howard Gale, another black player, came to. The, football club at the time we had some exciting players and then you talk about Eric Gates clever player clever player good Marco Gabardini exciting player you know he had everything pace strength could score goals out of nothing you know we had young players like your Hours and your Armstrongs you know good players you know then Borley came in you know um, John Kay you know so you know straight away I've, I've named what maybe eight nine players who were fantastic players in their own way um, and what I mean by that is that if I was going to war okay and I knew what I'm you know if I was going into war one player I'd take with me John Kay because I knew and other players knew who played with him and Borley and people like that you knew what you were going to get you knew what you was going to get from him you know Gary Owls and your Gordon Armstrongs. You knew what you were going to get, and that's what you—that's what you need. You need that sort of backup, that support. You know, you knew that once I crossed that white line, it weren't a case of right, come on, you better. You know, I knew. And you know, Kay was the one. Yeah, 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 and, and 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 you know, play play with Marco. You know, you didn't know what you were going to get out of Marco, in regards of. But then he'll just do something yeah. In terms magical. of finishing. And no. finishing, he'll just, out of nothing, bang, 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 and goal. 
Mm. And that's what he could get you. And that's why you pers persevered with Marco because you knew you get the ball and you're thinking there's nowhere to go and next minute, phew, ball's in the back of the net. Mm. In terms of like some a player like Gabby Dini, it was almost like when <coughs> Sunderland signed it, it was like an undiscovered star. If you know, <laughs> it feels because like um, obviously we've had play like yeah. over the years you look at players like Jamie Vardy also who've played yeah. through non league and worked their way up to that. You just wonder like now there could be a player like that playing in the lower leagues who's like well, I think there's a lot of, yeah. there's, a, there's a lot of players at, at that level in non league um, mm. and uh, not just non league there's a lot of local players as well in this area you know it's just a case of tapping into them or shall we say them getting the opportunity mm. uh, you look at um, Marco Gabardini you know eighty thousand pound from York City you know so the first thing when we heard that we were going to sign Marco Gabardini. We thought, wow, which Italian club is he come from? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can imagine, um, you know, in the morning there, we were waiting because we used to train up at uh, Maiden Castle up at Durham. So he was waiting and thinking, right, Marco Gabardini's coming in. So <laughs> straight away, you know, you're thinking, making a judgment here. Marco Gabardini, Italian, he's going to be six foot two, six foot three, <laughs> tanned with black hair or something mm. and then we get a shout there he is everyone's shouting where he said there <laughs> so everyone's looking looking on the pitch and they see this five foot ten blonde there pale as a bottle of milk they're thinking that cannot be Marco Gabardini <laughs> 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 but it was but you know but it, it, it was fantastic yeah. great lad great lad yeah. and then, not, then obviously you watched him play yeah, 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 yeah. Watched him play and it was excellent, excellent, and a, and a great partnership he had with Eric Gates. Yeah, you can imagine, like, when I pitch, like, when you look at Gabbiadini playing, like the goals he scored over the years, you can imagine in training it was exactly the same. And like being a goalkeeper, you knew you were in for a busy day with him on the training pitch. Yeah, definitely. So you know, a great finisher. Um, you know, he was good in the air. Great turn of pace. You know, you talk about pace nowadays, which is essential important he had that you know um but he also you know he can cause problems for defenders he's a great outlet but you know he could score goals and that partnership which he had with eric eric gates you know it's something just clicked and it worked and when you've got players of the caliber of gabardini and gates in your team then you knew that you've got a chance of creating and scoring goals Mm. It, was, it was a brilliant partnership between them two, wasn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. fantastic. You know, and they just did it off. They just did it off, and uh, you know, I, 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 I'm a great believer that if you've got a good team spirit off the pitch, then you'll have a good team spirit on the pitch as well. Yeah, and obviously going to in that famous playoff semi final away to Newcastle, where was it Marco was on the score sheet? The first game was nil nil, and just like in terms, I know in terms of overall performance just absolutely outstanding but like you would say he was like the star in yeah that yeah it, you know obviously all the plaudits go to your forwards you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know well, when, but obviously it, you, you kept yeah, out yeah. Mickey Quinn on the yeah yeah, well, that's, so, yeah that's what I said you know and rightly so you know what I mean the plaudits do go to the forwards but you know we had a team we had a manager we had um, players who believed in ourselves and you know going to St James's Park that night a lot of people didn't think, ooh, don't fancy him at St James's Park, you know. But we had that belief. Um, the, <sighs> supp the supporters who travelled on that night um, had that belief as well. Um, and you know, it's a, a fantastic achievement and a fantastic result. You know, to go there with all the pressure on us, and you knew what the outcome was going to be if you if you won the game. Um, to go there and win two nil, um, clean sheet again. So. It was great, and it's one which stands out. When you talk about results or going places to get results or winning at St James's Park, that's one of the highlights. Yeah, and I, I can imagine, obviously, you arriving on the supporters' bus that night. You'd just be thinking, how how on earth are, you, are we going to arrive into St James's Park? Because the atmosphere was intimidating. That well, it, yeah, it was intimidating, toxic, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. But, you know... We had players who were strong, mentally strong, you know what I mean? And it was a case of 
it wasn't going to get to us you know and I, I've talked about obviously you, you John Kays and you John McPhail who played at the back alongside me you Rupert Nagpoolers you Gary Owers Gordon Armstrong Gatesy people like that Brace um, Gabardini you know we had players who were focused and you know we had that belief that we were going to get a result because mm. obviously St James's Park especially in them days was like a more or less a fortress playing in that league and a really difficult place to go for opposite even now when you mm. go it's like obviously really high stands yeah. like rip supporters really close to the pitch and uh, obviously we, we were touching on earlier like grounds back in them days looked obviously pitches weren't the yeah. best but yeah. <laughs> just like to play on those grounds was probably just like an absolute treat yeah know? it's fantastic great you know and sometimes it's funny we we uh, uh, a couple of seasons ago, we went to um, Peterborough, and um, you know, beyond one of the goals, it's terracing. Okay, and I can remember one or two supporters thinking, "What's that?" They have, they didn't have a clue how to actually what, what they're going to do you, because they've not been used to terracing. Every ground now you look, it's all seated. You know, you, very rare you'll come across a ground which got terracing. You know, and they're thinking, well, how do you go about it? What do you do? Where do you stand? You know, but that brought to, shall we say, the atmosphere. You know, terrace. A lot of people used to stand on the terracing, and that's why a lot of people want to see terracing come back. You know, because of that sort of atmosphere which it brought to the football club. Um, coming towards the end of the podcast now. Um, this season, obviously, <coughs> mixed up. Um, Parkinson's come in. How how do you think? <laughs> it's it's a very hard question. Like, how, do you? I get I get I get that, I get that asked every single weekend. What do you think? How are they going to do tomorrow? <laughs> what, what do you think the score is going to be? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew what the lottery tickets yeah. were, numbers were going to be. But <laughs> no, this. I, I just hope, fingers crossed, that he gets them up and running and players buy into what he wants to do mm. and I'm not really worried about the performances as long as we get the three points I think the most important thing is to get out of this league we need to get out of this league um, because the longer we stay in this league I think the, the more worrying it becomes mm. and uh, I think you look at it we're not we're in a good position we're in a good position and it's in our hands, it's what we do, you know, and if we handle it the right way, go about it the right way, then I think we will get promoted. Gary, absolute pleasure Thank speaking you. to you. Thank you. Mate. Top man, Thanks. honestly top man.